Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our July 19th <laughs> joint English worship service. My name is Robin, and it's really good to be with you today. May God be praised by what we do here today. Um, if you would please be praying over Michael and the service as we are having some technology issues today. But even if those technology issues don't get figured out, God will be praised and we'll find another way. Amen. But well, we're all in need of some good news. We are still in a global pandemic. And in order to do what must be done to flatten the curve of infections, we're still unable to meet in person. Um, we are the children of God and by faith, we're here together and God is with us. We do have much to be thankful for. We have the good news of the gospel and the good news that even in hard times and difficulty, even when we're afraid and we have to keep that quiet and not confess that out loud, right? Because in order to be a good Christian, we mustn't fear, right? Well, God is our God and we are his people, the sheep under his care. God is here among his people. And so we have come together to worship him and call his name. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's Romans 10, 13. To call on the name of the Lord is to approach him in thanksgiving, worship, and petition. And in so doing, proclaim the name of God. This is the good news. And I imagine that we can all use some good news today. So we worship today. Think on the goodness of the Lord and come before him with thanksgiving and exalt him with music and song. So what are you grateful for? We just take a few moments to pause. We won't have a slide up, but just ponder that question. What or whom are you grateful for? Good news, like light, touches everything in the room. Like light, it spreads, rolling forward, never ending, chasing away the darkness. I'm back. Hi, Al. Okay, yes, um, I still don't see So today we celebrate and remember, we proclaim that light has come into the world, even though the world does not believe. We call upon the name of the Lord by faith. We come together in his name to proclaim that light has come and his name is Jesus, the Messiah, and he is here among the people of God. His goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our lives. Amen. Amen. Join in where you are. If you know the songs we sing, worship where you are and sing the Lord's praises. Leah is now going to lead our first song. It proclaims that we will, we will ever, ever need is Jesus. He is more than enough. 
Thank you, Robin. Good morning, everyone. Um, if we're still having difficulty with the slides, I can just share my screen. And so everyone can see the lyrics. Okay. I'm going to start with You Are My Supply. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you, Al. Good morning. Good morning, yes, but I don't see myself anymore. I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. That's okay, Al. Go ahead and mute yourself if you can so we can continue with the service. Yes, I did that, yes. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, Today I'm grateful for, I'm grateful that we have the word of God. Uh, I grew up knowing that um, Christians or brothers and sisters in other countries don't have access to Bibles as much as we do, that um, they have to be smuggled in and shared and, and like one page of the Bible is just so valuable so many uh, Christians who don't have the access that we do, we tend to take it for granted. Um, but I'm so thankful today that we have the freedom in this country that we can look it up on the internet, on our phones, in books, uh, in printed form, which is at our fingertips all the time. And I praise God that we that we have that freedom and that we have his word available to us. I'm going to do a little reading today from Psalm 118. 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. I was reflecting on this and um, I hear a lot of uh, expectation right now for bad things to continue happening. And they might. But the truth is you cannot trust in how the world and the timeline is going to develop. You can't trust in politics. You can't trust in any of the things that we look to for answers when bad things happen because those things are not constant. The constant thing in our lives is the Lord. And over and over again in the psalm, it says his mercy endures forever. It is constant. It is dependable. And even if things get worse, his mercy will continue to endure. Thank you so much for your sharing, Alicia. It was powerful and impressive. So from now on, yeah, we want to continue praising God. Um, the song we'll be singing is In Christ Alone. And it seems the technical trouble is continuous, so I'll be sharing the relief from my iPad. Okay, let's praise together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, Born through the fiercest drought and storm, What height of love, what depths of peace, When fears us tears, when striving cease, My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. In Christ alone Who took on flesh Fullness of God in heaven This gift of love and righteousness Spawn by the one he came to say Tear on the cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ Light of the world by darkness rain Then bursting forth in glorious day Up 
from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curses lost his grave on me But with the precious blood then Christ But with the precious blood of Christ Okay, Bob, are you with us? Yes, I am. And All I'll right. be, I'm, I'm going to be reading from uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 through 37. <clears throat> this is the word of the God, of the Lord. The time is coming, declared the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And I will not be like and, and I will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declared the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declared the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, and from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I have forgiven their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. This is what the Lord says, he who appoints the sun to shine by day, who declares the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that the waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. This is what the Lord says, only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out. I will reject all of the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. This is the word of God. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate the reading. Thank you, Randy. Um, so this, this uh, particular week, I've uh, been reflecting on um, God's covenant, and hence the sermon uh, is the God's covenant love. And, um, you know, God's covenant can also be uh, referred to as the promises of God. And, you know, uh, th that phrasing, the promises of God, it can be a, a loaded term. You know, we, we, all of us, we come from most, mostly, we come from like different church backgrounds and different church experiences. And, um, you know, when you hear the promises of God, uh, uh, again, it's a, it's a loaded term. So some of the images that can be evoked when that terminology is used um, is negative, right? It's, it's a line oftentimes that phrase the promises of God with like prosperity gospel. Uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, a get rich quick phrase, <laughs> phrase. <laughs> Um, you know, get something for nothing, like a very self-centered Christian bias at the exclusion of others. So when I talk about the covenant of God, um, I want to provide that disclaimer. You know, this is not some type of uh, get rich quick or some type of self-centered prosperity gospel. Uh, but with that disclaimer uh, provided and said, you know, I am very confident that there is... Uh, there is a tremendous amount of biblical content 
that describes it's God making binding agreements with his people. God intentionally, volitionally obligates himself uh, to, in essence, makes these covenants with his people. Um, in spite of the people, Jeremiah alludes to it, in spite of the people's failings, in spite of their sinfulness, their rebellion, their rejection, right, their distractions, despite of all these things, God still imposes his goodness upon his people through these covenants. Um, you know, I'm going to provide some slides. Uh, my inner Keith is calling this week, so <laughs> I'm going to use technology. All right. So uh, bear with me. But here are some slides. I want to talk a little bit more about these covenants. Uh, Jeremiah mentioned one covenant in particular, the Mosaic covenant. And then he also talks about the new covenant. Uh, but there, again, like I said, there's multiple covenants in scripture. So um, let me share my screen. Okay, so the, these biblical covenants, you know, I got to give out to, uh, a shout out to uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Slivgi of uh, uh, DTS. Um, I borrow a lot of this information from him. Um, but biblical covenants, essentially, um, it, it begins in, script, in the Old Testament with what we call the Adamic covenant. And this is God essentially creating us human beings uh, with a very special value in mind. He emphasizes humans as made in his image, and that connotes a variety of things primarily like you're going to, I'm giving you authority to rule and do, uh, rule and reign over, over my entire creation, right? So the Adamic covenant. And if you read Old Testament, if you continue to read on, you realize like pride, um, ego, and just this very self, self-centered uh, independent autonomy uh, took over human beings and God grew very impatient. And then what happens? The flood, right? Where essentially he, he destroys, if not all, mostly all of mankind. Uh, but then scripture describes God as, you know, having remorse. And then he reestablishes the Adamic covenant through Noah, the Noahic covenant, right? And it's essentially a continuation of the Adamic covenant. I, I, I reinstate this authority, this dominion upon human beings, my most valued and cherished creation, right? And then from then it goes to the Adamic covenant and in the Adamic, uh, Abrahamic covenant rather, um, there is actually, again, this is not a prosperity gospel type of uh, teaching, you know, cause I don't think that aligns with scripture, but you can't avoid the fact that in the Abrahamic covenant, God promises Israel what? I'm going to give you bless. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you resources, right? I'm going to give you seed, nation. You're going to multiply, be fruitful, right? And you're going to fill the earth. That is undoubtedly biblical, and that's included in scripture, right? And then we continue on. God makes another covenant, the Mosaic covenant, right? I'm going to bring you out of slavery. I'm going to give you, again, it kind of reinserts the Abrahamic covenant in, Abrahamic covenant in certain regards. And so I'm going to give you a, a promise, right? A promised land. Right? There's going to be blessings, but there's also cursing. The Mosaic covenant was conditional, right? You got, this is where God introduces the law, right? If you abide by my law, you will be blessed. If you rebel, you will be cursed, right? But nevertheless, there's a, a, a Mosaic co covenant. Uh, centered around a promised land. And then we continue on in the Old Testament, and then there's the D uh, Davidic covenant, a uh, promised kingship. This points more to the Messiah, but this kingship is promised. Uh, you will not be subdued by any other nation state anymore, right? Your Messiah is coming, right? And he's going to come with power and authority. Uh, so these are the new Old Testament covenants, and they are, they are biblical, they are biblical, they are in the Bible, and it promises a variety of things. Again, God obligates himself to his people, right, to, to, to be a blessing, to impose his goodness upon them. And then there's a, uh, there's a break from the Old Testament covenant before uh, we actually read out the new covenant. Um, you don't have to turn to it, but Romans 11, uh, verses 11 through 15 
um, describes uh, what happens when the Old Testament covenants uh, transition into the New Covenant. Uh, Romans 11, it says, again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Um, so Paul right here, he clearly states that um, there's a continuity in God's covenants from the Old Testament to the New Testament. All these covenants, all these promises that God made to Israel, Judah, right? The Jews, essentially. What he's saying in Romans 11 is like now, because of uh, Israel's continuous rejection and failing, God has deemed that there is a, a, a new group of people involved in his covenant promise, and that is us, the Gentiles, right? So there's a continuity in the covenants, meaning it's still, it's still God's promises. It's still, he's still imposing his good, but the discontinuity is now, it's not only isolated to Israel, Judah, the Jews, right? But there is an inclusion of the Gentiles, right? And Paul articulates here, man, God's vision is one day, not only the Gentiles, right? But also the rest of the Jews will uh, believe, have faith, and receive all these blessings, right? All these covenants. Um, you know, there are some, uh, there's some differing views as to how all this is going to be fulfilled. There's actually some very heated debates within the evangelical community regarding exactly who's going to get what, <laughs> how it's going to happen, and when God's promises, like when all these covenants are going to be fulfilled. Uh, in relationship with the church and with Israel. But I don't want to focus on that, you know, these differences today because, you know, it just doesn't preach. It's all like theological speculation. Uh, but um, I do want to provide a, a statement that actually the PCUSA provides regarding uh, the end of the world, how, how these fulfillments are going to actually take place. And uh, it's a very wise, in my perspective, interpretation, a very wise interpretation of a very uh, nuanced and layered concept of how these covenants are going to be fulfilled. And the PCUSA puts out this statement in their, in their website, and it just basically says, since there is only one God who has created the world and intends good for all creatures, there is no need for despair or fear. God's purpose does not depend on human achievement, though human participation is clearly sought by God. Rather, Jesus teaches us to feed the hungry, heal the sick, care for the suffering, free the oppressed, preach good news to the poor and dis disenfranchised. God's full purpose remains to be accomplished, but his certainty is assured. Again, in my opinion, very wise interpretation. It's essentially saying God's covenant love emphasizes, this is, this is the takeaway from everything that I've said, right? Everything that I've, I've written out, the takeaway is this, it's a unilateral, uh, it's a unilateral promise. It's, it's in the nature of God. He makes this unilateral promise, right? Uh, his benevolence and generosity is bestowed upon his people. We are the most valued of all of God's creatures, human beings, right? And God is determined in spite of us, in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our sin, in spite of our, our self-centeredness, God is determined to impose his goodness upon us. And essentially, that is what all these covenants are talking about. And the new covenant in particular highlights it's not about what we, what we say, what we do, right? It's about God. Who God is, God's nature is, man, I'm, no matter what, 
through my grace, my grace alone, I am going to bring goodness into your life. Okay? So, you know, with that in mind, this is what the covenant of God uh, should fill us with, right? This assurance that God, the God that we worship is so, so good, right? So good to us. So with that in mind, you know, like you'll read crazy stuff. You'll read crazy stuff, even online, especially online, about the end times. And even the, the coronavirus, man, when you remember when the coronavirus started happening, we go to the market, there's, there's no water, there's no toilet paper, right? Like, what, what was the instinctual reaction? Weren't you, weren't you anxious? Weren't you afraid? But in light of God's covenant, anxiety, fear, panic regarding some type of crazy, apocalyptic, prophetic, you know, end time, climactic event, we're encouraged to to lay those fears and anxieties aside, right? Because the new covenant in particular reminds us, teaches us what? God loves and cares about us so much. He has, he has exalted us to such a high place in his creation. And, and the old covenant testaments is a, is a great reminder that, man, look at, the, look at the Israelites, how time and time again they, they, they disobeyed these conditional promises that God made. They didn't keep them. And in spite of the hundreds and thousands of years of disobedience, God finally comes with the new covenant. And he says, not only the Gentiles, but the Jews too. I want all of you guys, I want all of my children to be blessed, right? to be blessed. So the question I want to ask is, is the assurance of God's promises evident in how we live our lives? Yes, no, sometimes, you know, answers may vary, but I want, you know, again, I take time this morning uh, to teach and affirm God's covenant based on his grace. It's overwhelmingly present in the Bible. However, um, I think there's some doubt. I think there's doubt whether the promises of God are effectively being experienced by Christians and effectively be, being experienced at the local church level. Uh, there was a recent study uh, by the Barner Research Group, and the study was entitled State of the Church. And uh, overall, this, this, uh, this study concluded that, um, you know, one in three practicing Christians has essentially stopped attending church during uh, coronavirus. Um, there's some more detailed statistics I want to share. Uh, so during COVID-19, online church attendance among practicing Christians, uh, 35%, they're still, we're still there. That's us, right? We're still there attending church, uh, right? We're still, we're still on online church. 14%, they've switched churches uh, from, from uh, when Corona's in the midst of Corona. And then 32%, they just stopped. They stopped attending church dur during Corona. And then 18%, they go back and forth, right? They'll go from this church to that church online, just switching. Uh, the study continues, and it says that uh, online churching based on generations, boomers, right? Oh, good old boomers, man, faithful. <laughs> uh, but boomers, 40% 40 40 stayed at the same church. 11% of boomers switched churches, and then 26, even, even the boomers, the good old faithful boomers, 26% of them stopped attending during coronavirus. And then the Gen X, that's my generation, right? 31% uh, of us are still going to church online, 17% uh, of the Gen X's switched churches, and then 35%, that's a pretty significant number, stopped attending church during coronavirus. And then the millennials, y'all like a finicky bunch uh, to begin with, slippery fish, as I, I like to describe the millennials. But 30% of the millennials, they're still at it. 8% switch churches. And then a whopping 50%. 50% of millennials have stopped attending any type of church with, uh, on, online during corona. Right? Um, this is the last slide I want to share. Um, 
it asks what type of support, the right part of the chart, what type of support do you need from your church right now, right? And amongst the ones that stayed at the same church, uh, let's just focus on that first category. The ones that stayed at the church, 52% of them are saying prayer and emotional support. 68% of the people that switched churches say prayer and emotional support. And then the ones that stopped going to church altogether, 48%. So that's the highest category. The, the, whether they stayed at the church, whether they left the church or they switched churches, there's a, there's a lot of people that are seeking what? Like emotional security, stability, right? Some type of foundational certainty. And they want, they want prayer, right? They, they're seeing, like Alicia alluded to, they're seeing that, man, the politic, politicians, they're doing what they can, but man, I don't have too much confidence in them. My business, I'm still getting a paycheck, but man, you never know when things are going to go left or right, right? So was, there's this undergirding sense of just nervousness and anxiety, and they want, they want support, right? And then some of the other categories are a bi more Bible-centered message of hope and encouragement, and of course, connection with community. So according to the Barna research study, many people have, it's, it's kind of safe to assume that many people are not, possibly not experiencing God's promises of goodness as individual Christians, and more so maybe even at the local church level in, in the COVID-19 uh, era, right? And so I asked, I asked another follow-up question, why, right, why? Uh, there's many possible reasons why, but one possible reason I want to uh, focus in on before I close is um, I borrow from Dr. Tama Bryant. Uh, she has a great podcast called Homecoming. Uh, she's a minister, psychologist, just, you know, very, very insightful. Uh, but she recently uh, had an episode in her podcast uh, focusing on abandonment, right? And she called it healing from abandonment issues. And I think that might be... Um, provide some clarity as to why people feel so vulnerable, right? They feel so insecure. There's this under, under, undergirding uh, kind of foundation, uh, undergirding feeling of anxiety and angst, right? And we read about the promises of God, but it's a, we have a hard time really digesting it, owning it, and ha it having impact in our lives. Uh, so Dr. Bryant suggests that man, there is an anxiety. When, when we have been abandoned in various ways, anxiety is, is a real thing, and it, it, it doesn't just stay in a vacuum inside of us. It impacts. It impacts our relationships. And I would add to Dr. Bryant's uh, uh, description and say, um, whatever we feel horizontally, right, if we have a deep sense of angst and anxiety about uh, things that are going around, on around us, I suggest, I think it's biblical that yes, it has vertical impact as well. Again, if I have angst and anxiety about my horizontal uh, relationships and situations, I would, I would bet that it has vertical uh, ramifications, right? There's, there's these trust, there's these trust issues in terms of uh, my relationship with God. Um, a, a sense of abandonment can make us fearful and we start asking ourselves these questions like is there something wrong with me right is there something wrong with us do i do i really have the capacity be capacity to be loved and cared for will people actually stick around with me right and again further it may impact our response to god's promises the causes of any type of abandonment issues man they're so wide they're so wide and i would say none of us are immune to experiencing abandonment in this, in this, in this world. Um, it can be as simple as emotionally unva unavailable parents, uh, emotionally un unavailable spouses, uh, even financial, like if you're experiencing financial hardships now or whether you grew up in uh, poverty, this creates a sense of tremendous angst, anxiety and uncertainty. Um, even in, in romantic relationships, like if you've, if, if anyone remember dating, those of us who have been in a long-term relationship, remember, uh, have you ever 
been ghosted in dating. You guys know what being ghosted is? You're texting, you're having a conversation with somebody for a couple of days, then you, you think it's going real well, and then you text them one day, hey, how's it going? And then you don't hear from them <laughs> forever. They just ghosted, they went away, right? Even that, even a small thing like that, that could impact us. It impacts our psyche and our emotional state, right? Uh, even more, more, more definitive divorce, tragic deaths, right? You ever experienced someone who just, who was there one minute and then boom, uh, you know, tragically they just passed away. Uh, sudden changes in our lives, right? Maybe you got fired. Maybe you, we had to move cities, and you know we didn't know anybody there. That we had to restart. Um, there's all these things. She she lines out all these all these uh, regular everyday events and her point being that it impacts us right it impacts us it affects us it has an impact on our psychology and our emotional stage and as christians uh you know spiritually it, these have an impact in our in our in our being in our doing in our relationships very important that we heal from any abandonment uh, wounds of abandonment. How? Self-awareness. Right? Understanding ourselves, seeing the role that, you know, anxiety and abandonment issues has contributed to, to, to our relationships in unhealthy ways. Ask ourselves, like, have I carried these abandonment issues in my life? And then she says, not only self-awareness, but we need to interrupt, right? Interrupt these dysfunctional patterns and practice patterns that honor ourselves right that may mean moving away from certain toxic relationships or environments and that may also mean like embracing uh certain healthy more healthy relationships um dr bryant finally she just she just re-emphasizes uh the need and i think interestingly enough i think this aligns with new covenant teaching uh or new covenant yeah new covenant teaching in the bible but she essentially says that uh, we are not based, like our value is not based on our accomplishments, our performances, right? Our net earnings or our gross earnings, right? Our value is not based on performance. Just, just by being who you are, just by being who you are, good and bad, everything, just as you are right now, right? As you are right now, you have tremendous worth, tremendous value. Is that, is that not New Covenant teaching, right? You are authentically, genuinely worthy of care, right? That is contrary to abandonment. The New Covenant teaches that, man, just because you're Randy, oh, God, God is... God is determined to bring goodness into your life, Randy. It's who he is. It's just in his nature. He's, he's going to bring, and he continues to bring goodness into your life. So Dr. Brian says, take, I love this phrasing. She says, take sacred pause on a regular basis. Just take sacred pause. And that's what we're doing today, this Sunday afternoon, right? We're taking sacred pause and we're asking ourselves individually and corporately, am I living my life like an abandoned child? Right. Am I? Am I living my life like there is no powerful, benevolent being right, that is intent on bringing goodness to my life? Do I, do I live and operate with this type of belief and confidence, right? Or am I, am I living my life like an orphan? Right, like an abandoned child or a covenant child. She says, take, she says, take sacred pause and ask ourselves uh, these questions. And you know, not, this, is not, this doesn't apply to our church. I think our church is, is one of the most uh, uh, accepting and gracious communities that I've been a part of. Uh, but there are certain churches and, uh, and, and, and just communities where it's like, they don't, Sacred pause is, when we try to take sacred pause, we're judged, right? Like, you're not doing enough. You're not giving enough. You're not doing all this stuff. It's like, nope, not here. Not in this community, right? Uh, 
I know and I pray that we continue to be a community that encourages our members, pause, right? Take sacred pause. Am I, am I living like an abandoned child or, I'm, or am I living like a covenant child? Um, take time to heal any abandonment issues involving risking deep conversations, being vulnerable, facing our fears, making necessary adjust, uh, adjustments in our lives. Even if we don't fully rationally believe that I'm a covenant child, I still have a, a lot of abandonment belief. Even if we don't fully believe it, still live it out. You know, live it out. Make these, make these uh, adjustments in our life in spite of the doubt, in spite of the fear incorporate actions in our lives that align with covenant type of thinking, covenant type of uh, beliefs, right? And then overcome, right? That, that is the descriptor of God's covenant people. We overcome our challenges, overcome the challenges presented to us by this external world. Because I have full belief that God has made a promise in spite of me, in spite of us, to bring goodness into our lives, into my life. Uh, in closing, um, you know, our country recently lost a giant, giant figure when it comes to uh, civil rights, uh, social justice reform, uh, beloved Congressman John Lewis. Um, you know, uh, rest in peace. You know, I, um, I recently heard a Zoom meeting with Congressman Lewis, uh, former President Barack Obama, and there were a lot of just black advocates, right? And a lot of them were more male for various reasons, but, um, and, and the conversation uh, revolved around um, uh, just change, reform, but also mental illness, mental health, right? And this young black male advocate, he directed a question to Congressman Lewis, and then he was, he, his question was essentially like, man, how'd you do it, right? How did you overcome so much trial, so much tribulation? And by his question and just kind of, you know, you read his facial expressions, you could, you could, it's probably safe to assume that this young male black advocate, he, he's having his own trials. He's having his own challenges and difficulties and he in doubt and, and fear and angst is probably weighing on him. Right? So he's asking the older person who he respects, how did you do it? And John Lewis's, um, immediate reply was he said my faith right my faith and then he goes i really thought i was gonna die on that bridge you guys remember that iconic picture of, of john lewis getting hit right with with batons and just getting beaten because he was protesting for civil rights he says i really thought i was gonna die on that bridge that day and he said while he was getting beat he's like i prayed to god god keep me alive Keep me alive. I want, I want to be here on this earth. And God did, right? He kept them alive. Brothers and sisters, sometimes God's promises are as simple as that. Okay? Are as simple, like, we're alive, right? Like old people always tell me, older people always tell me like, hey, man, thank God you're just alive, right? Because me, sometimes in my head, I'm like, oh, this is not happening. That's not happening. How come this is not occurring? And then I get so conflated and then so fearful and anxious about all these expectations that I, I have in my life that are perceived to be unfulfilled. And what wisdom is teaching me is, man, any day above ground is a good day. Any day above ground is the good. What did you and I do to earn the gift of life? Nothing. It's a gift. And that's what John Lewis is saying, man. Like, you know, he's experienced a lot of hardships in his life, right? But he's saying, man, that from that moment on, he's like, God's real. God's really, he's just going to bring goodness. It's going to be ups and downs, but he's going to bring goodness, right? Every day above ground, for you and I is a good day, right? And, 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 and knowing the covenants of God, right? More, more uh, clearly after today, we, man, there should be no doubt in anybody's mind if you're participating in this service that God's sole intent in life is to bring goodness into your life, to bring goodness into my life, right? It's just gonna happen no matter what.
in spite of our, in spite of ourselves. And the second thing I want us to take away from, from John Lewis's uh, legacy is that his life evolved in a way where his aim in life was maybe even more so than himself is like, I want to see the covenants of, of, of the promises of God fulfilled in your life, right? In your life, especially for the disenfranchised, right? And I think that's the heart of our father, if I may be so bold. <laughs> I think that's the heart of our father, right? He's going to take care of us. He wants us as his children to evolve into an individual, to a community, right? That is, is even more so concerned about the covenants being fulfilled in their lives. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we do not doubt it is here in black and white. From Genesis to Revelation, you are God of covenant. We have nothing, nothing to offer you to receive your benevolence, benevolence, generosity, and blessedness. It is just a unilateral promise you give to us. But in this fallen and sinful world, we have all experienced abandonment on various degrees, and we get, we're fragile, we get nervous, we get anxious, we get fearful, uh, we get scared, God. But let us be reminded uh, this, this morning, this afternoon, to take sacred pause in our regular rhythms of life, to realign us, not with abandoned children, not with orphans, but we are blessed, chosen, covenant people. And let our lives uh, look, smell, feel like this type of uh, divine confidence. And as we experience and embody this confidence, let us be uh, determined uh, to be supporters of the promises of God being fulfilled in our brothers and sisters, our neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.